Welcome to Punch Keys Podcast. I'm Poppy Minix, your co-host, bringing you blunt talk for the fiction novelist. And I'm Cass Kay, your other writerly co-host. If you love to ramble about writing and need a tribe, you found us. Are you ready? We're uncorking now. Let's talk about punching those keys. Poppy. <gasps> Cass, it's time. Yes. <laughs> it is Punch Keys time. I love punch keys time. Oh, it's the best. It really is. And tonight's even doubly best because it's all about the antagonist. That is your version of heaven. Oh, yeah. That's where everything starts getting juicy and good. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> you can't really have a super juiced story without an antagonist. No, you can't. So let's just set some ground rules. Oh, I'm today. excited. Okay, let's do that. Uh, I like that rules excite you. This is this is some fun. days. It depends on the day. Okay. So whenever I say villain or antagonist, yes, I swap out the two back and forth. I do understand the difference, and I do understand their antagonistic forces. Yes. Sometimes the antagonistic force is like a you know like the movies where there's a volcano erupting. Yes. I mean, the volcano is the villain, right? which you would call an antagonistic force. So I'm not going to put villain I won't antagonist, you. an it's antagonist cool. force in the right space. <laughs> I'm not going to mad lib this exactly right all the time. Sure. Um, but you know what I'm talking about. We're talking about, you know, the push and shove that makes the protagonist have to work for what they want. Yes, absolutely. That's what we're talking about tonight. True. Ugh, you asked me a question once. Uh, that I think was hugely, hugely important. And you asked me about, um, you asked me how I introduce my villains. Always a good time. How do you introduce the villain? How do you know it's the bad guy? And that's a good question, too, because, I mean, like, everything with writing, I mean, isn't there, like, a bazillion answers and a bazillion ways to yes. do it? Yes, yes, absolutely. There's two different types of introductions. There's the introduction where you know it's the villain stepping on the stage, and the sneaky one where you think, Think it's just another character and you find out later it's a villain, right? Right. Yes. I think if it's the introduction where you know it's the villain, it has to be something that makes an impression. Right. It's like whenever we're thinking about those first chapters when we're first introducing the protagonist to the reader. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know about you, but that first chapter, I mean, only gets written two million times. And it's only only like the hardest thing in the world because you have to grab everyone in that first chapter and make them attached to your protagonist and so much. just a tiny little bit of pressure no big deal yes <laughs> but i think that same type of pressure should be put on the introduction to your antagonist i agree with you it's got to be super important all the things you think about with your protagonist you should think about with your villain Thinking about how the setting reveals, how the clothing reveals, how the speech pattern reveals, how the other characters in the scene react to them. Yes. All of these things are just as important and give just as much information and clues to the person. For a villain as it does a hero, a protagonist, antagonist. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the story, right? I mean, the heart of our story is going to be with these two characters. It is. And you don't have a protagonist that matters and that is interesting unless you have an antagonist that is pushing them and pushing their morals and pushing their theme and pushing everything about them you i feel you like you're the, the joker sides, right now right oh <laughs> is it is it my pose hmm. i'm feeling a little more like um oh shoot no your words though about pushing oh, yeah i mean push. that's joker's mentality and psych psychological thought in everything he does with the Batman is his job is to make him better. His existence yes. pushes Batman to be Batman. That is true. It's I always find that one so fascinating. I mean, so many people love Joker just because a fun villain is engaging and entertaining. Yes. Um, so just like any character that's fun and a little unpredictable – Mm -hmm. You were like, going, and then what? The chaos. People love the chaos. Yeah. But I think it's a beautiful metaphor for writing protagonists and antagonists. Yes. Because everything the Joker says, even though he's the bad guy and he's supposed to be super crazy, everything he says about making Batman Batman and pushing him, that's exactly what your antagonist should do. Absolutely. Like, 
That's that's the goal. That's Joker is telling you straight how a villain should be. Yeah, that is true. It's always so ironic to me, especially that scene. Which which Batman is it? The Heath Ledger Batman, the best Batman. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, and like he says that, and it's just like, oh, so much truth, truth bomb, Joker. Oh man, truth bombs everyone's are like awesome. he's crazy. Well, yeah, but at the same time, it's like, is he? Is he crazy? Crazy with the truth. Crazy with the truth. Gosh, I love a good villain. I really do. And they're so difficult. And I find, especially when you're starting out in writing, it's like, oh my gosh, I have this amazing protagonist. And so like, we've talked about protagonists and we talked about how awesome and real and fantastic and how much depth you have to put into them. And it's great. And then I feel like sometimes you start and you have this amazing protagonist and you're like, oh, the villain. Yeah, I need a villain. Okay, uh, here's a villain. Okay, he's a bad guy and he's bad because he's bad. Because oh, bad, no. bad guys do bad things, right? And they're just bad. And that's that. Oh. Okay, cool. Done. Woo! <laughs> Done. Right? And it's like, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. You gotta, wait, you gotta wait, come back. Wait, wait, wait. Let's back up. Let's, back, Let's up. back up. You can't just... And honestly, I will honestly tell you, I have done this. <laughs> I've had to repair it immensely. I was a genius and put in two antagonists into my story. And both of them were exactly the same. And they were just bad because they're, they're good now you figured it out oh I, I figured it out thank goodness before i published i mean okay we're going to talk about the editing process a whole whole bunch and how you have to do it this is why you have to do it because if i would have <laughs> published that first draft would have been like hey two bad guys that are exactly the same and they're just bad because they're bad yep bad <laughs> badden it up all over the bad place so it's just not cool all the rules that we told you about a protagonist having backstories and motivations yes. for why they do what they do that builds them and makes them consistent. <laughs> Surprise! It was a lot of work, right? And I was like, <laughs> okay, I finished that. We're good. Oh. You're not good. You have okay. to keep going. I'm sorry. Now you I need do. you to do that for your antagonist. Yes. Like, seriously, just as much work. I need you to do just all of as that. Much work. Yes. Oh. If you have a person as the antagonist... All right. And there are other forms. If you write romance or other genres, it just depends, then your antagonist can very well be a part of your person who's not allowing them to find love or whatever reason. It can be an emotion. It can be a storm. It can be all kinds of different things. But if your antagonist is a person and you still have to put in a lot of thought to those things, I mean, there has to be a reason behind it. You can't just be like, oh, my antagonist is that my protagonist is sad and can't be in a relationship. Okay, well, obviously we need to go deeper there, right? Please. Please. please, please God, please. please go deeper. So it, it can't it can't just be to be. Um, and so, and but if it's a person, yeah, you're going to have to really dig deep and make them just as, you know, you need to have just as much stuff as you put that effort in. You need to have the effort in your your well, I think, too, when we're looking at, like, romance or we're looking at going deeper in psychology stuff, sometimes the antagonistic force is a belief that the protagonist has. Yes, that, too. Mm -hmm. So, and that, the same rules kind of apply there. Because you have to find out where that belief was born and how it was enforced all in the backstory. Yes. And the same rules apply that we said with the protagonist where you can't just announce all of this backstory the first time you introduce them. Like, it has to be trickled out in different scenes and um even if especially it gets a little bit trickier because a lot of times your antagonistic force doesn't have a point of view you're not right. telling the story from their mind their mouth their faulty belief the volcano doesn't speak right and so you have to find ways to reveal all of that information and it's it's really kind of fun <laughs> <laughs> so remember how I talked about like in the protagonists, I was like, oh, I find out my protagonist by learning about the theme and about the side characters and about the setting and the world, the lore in the world. And all of this teaches me something about my protagonist, my antagonist, one of my things I found, um, I recently, about a year ago, I finished a book and it was the first draft of it, finished writing it. And I got to the end scene and my villain had a explanation monologue of why they did oh, the thing they did. Oh, that happens. So I was like, oh no, I failed. 
Yeah, that's a first draft villain right there. But I figured out something really cool in the process of figuring it out and fixing it um, was that I had to go and I had to find anything in the story, any character, any scene, any setting that would be able to reveal something about my villain, even when the villain wasn't in the scene. Yeah. And that was really fun because it changed dialogue between characters. Yes. changed like the focus of some scenes and i was able to like reveal so much about them without them in the scene yes which was super fun too um super fun so that's another thing to keep an eye on too is a lot of times your antagonistic force can have a presence without even being on the stage yeah and that's i mean that's huge um they have to know about them or at least somebody does in my i mean To an extent, it just depends. There's all kinds of different, again, this is one of those crazy things where there is a thousand different antagonists and how to get there. But you can't just pop them in and say, I'm the bad guy. And then that is their dialogue. And then they're bad because they're bad. And then... Nobody I mean, you knows can't anything do this, about but them. Please don't ask me to read it for you, right? Nobody, nobody knows anything about them, and then all of a sudden they come up and they explain that they stop, and their 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 evil bad guy cape is fluttering in the wind, and they're like, <laughs> "This is pretty purple." They're always yes. black and purple. Yes, it's black and purple, and then you know they ball their fist and they shake it at the sky, and they just tell everybody what their game plan is and how everyone is going to follow them and do this exact evilness that they have done and they've decided is going to happen in the world because just for reasons so this is not a good villain please don't make that villain um there needs to be a creep factor and in my personal opinion i love a villain that could almost be a book boyfriend or girlfriend. <laughs> if I am like a little bit in love with a villain, I'm like, yeah, yeah. What in the world is going to happen? Because I'm almost on your team. I am so close to being on your team that I would think about going to the bad side. Like, I'm going to out you a little bit. I think you crush on villains. I do I don't, crush on villains a little bit. I don't bit. think I've had a villain you didn't crush on. That is true. Your villains are <laughs> super... <laughs> super awesome bad guys and are so creepy but at the same time there's just some charm factor to them that just strikes the right chord <gasps> and and that is that i love a charming bad guy i yeah, really, he eats really people do. but he looks really good while he does it poppy's like not that okay, he looks really okay, good <laughs> it's the dialogue woman it is that like it, it's the way that they handle things and it is the backstory and it's like this you know it, it's <sighs> It's the charm factor and it's that whole, it's the way that they are able to like deliver the fact that, yeah, okay, this needs to happen. And it is not the ideal situation for a normal populace, but here's why it needs to work. And I, and if they sell that to me, if they sell to me why they are evil and I'm like, that's okay, I, I kind of freaking get that. Like I could understand how this happened and how you think it needs to be better and how it could be better under your rule. All right. All right. All right. I'm 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 almost in. Okay. <laughs> so then you have your protagonist to be like, no, wait. No, wait. That's a bad idea. And here is why. And I want this, like, I want to sit and I want to watch this, just this whole debate flourish through your book. <laughs> like, I, I'm all about that. I want to be like, okay. All right. So like, all right. Protagonist got me back. Cool. 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 All right. I'm good now. The bad guy's the bad guy. All right. I'm back. I'm Poppy back. Is and not then, like, a loyal reader. She's going to hide I am sides. not a loyal reader. And then I'm like, okay. <laughs> she villain is a walks love back triangle's in. worst nightmare. She's like, <laughs> team who? Can I be yeah, team no, both? What? <laughs> I know. How about team everybody? Sweet. So, and then the villain comes back in and I'm like, oh, back on the scene. Okay. What you going to say? And like, I want those moments where I I can't decide. I cannot decide whether or not, you know, what t-shirt am I going to wear? Who am I hashtagging today? I'm not sure. That's I love those books. That That is is good writing. And that's a charismatic villain. I think those are the villains too, that you know, they're the villain when they, from the moment they step on, there's no questioning instead of the slow reveal that they're a villain. Yes. Which is also fun. I like that one, too. I do like that sneaky villain where you're like, okay, there's something just maybe a little bit off. Hmm. Hmm. I'm going to ponder that one a little bit. But, you know, they're so nice. Like, <laughs> they're geez, 
I mean, <laughs> things they're supposed to be doing, right? Mostly, I think that's yeah. right. I mean, she has like a dog, and that's like a hero right there, right? The yeah. the, the chick who's got the dog, and but she's you're complimenting like, the protagonist and saying right? nice things. I mean, she's asking her a lot of questions, but she's complimenting right? her answers. Yeah, I mean it. It okay? Logically, this all adds up, and then all of a sudden, it's like oh, oh. Uh, Oh, and stuff starts snapping into place, and you're like, oh, I love those. I will read that until 3 o'clock in the morning when I'm supposed to get up at 5. <laughs> and I will be mad at you, but I will also want to hug you, too. So <laughs> I think one of my favorite villains is the um, super intellectual smart villain. Yes. Those are where, really fun. I mean, I to the point where the darkest hour in the book, the point where everything's going wrong and bad and just crashing down, it just seems impossible for the villain not to win, not because of circumstances, but because they've thought of everything and they are so smart. They're pro- so prepared. They are so prepared for this moment. Yeah, and they're, and they're smart in how they argue it and why they're doing it and their dialogue and... Oh, I love me some intelligence. Mmm, yeah. I do, yes, I I do like that as well. I also just like the, I don't know, I like chaos, man. I really just love those characters where it's like, you kind of, there's part of you that is them. Like, there there's part of them you see in yourself sometimes where I'm like, you know those moments where you just like sometimes wish that you could just take a chair and throw it through a window? You know you're not going to do that because you're a good person and you're just not. But like... But your antagonist they are is do it for you. Because they are just like all over the place and they just do not give an ever loving crap. And it's just like I I really relate to tantruming villains sometimes. It just depends. <laughs> you do like tantrum. I really do. I really love a tantruming <laughs> villain. So I think it just it depends on what resonates with you. But I think the biggest part is just I want to be sold on why. Because Which goes back to the same thing we're saying with protagonists. There has yes. to be a backstory built. There has to be, they had to have a reason for what's motivating them all before page one starts. Yes. Um. I mean, unless it's like an origin story, I guess something could happen where they're. Ah, there's so many, or it depends too. And then you end up getting tropey in your villain origin stories, so. But take the same, I mean, I think that's the biggest advice is take the same care that you took with all of the details for your protagonist and do that for your antagonist too. Yes. Because it's half the story. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely half the story. And if one of them is boring, the story is boring. If the protagonist is boring or if the antagonist is boring. If yeah. they're not consistent, if there's no depth or why, why would you root for them? Why would you, even if it's something you want to root against because it just is so wrong? Yes. That's a feeling too. That's good. Like you don't have to, you don't have to make the reader torn, but you have to make them care who wins. Yes. Yeah. And if you're listening to this podcast and you are halfway through your first draft and you're going, my villain sucks. My villain is just mean to be mean. Seriously, just keep going and finish. I swear it, it just go back. Make sure that you edit and make sure that you edit them correctly and you give them more of a backstory. They might just be a placeholder right now. They might not even have the right name. I mean, just get it down and get your story down and then really make it flourish. It's okay for that to happen sometimes. That happened for me. I mean, I, I really did have these like placeholder villains where they're like, oh, evil, that is me. And then I had to go and be like, okay, but why? But why? Okay, edit number two and three when I was just figuring out things. I'm like, but why are they so angry? Why are they trying to take over the world? Would they even have the capacity to do that? So, you know, what's the different motives here? And, you know, that that comes with time. That comes with thinking it through and really getting stuff down. Well, I really like the advice, too, of keep going. Because yeah. stopping and going to fix it and redo the beginning with the motivations. When I was talking earlier about, okay, so I had a whole first draft and I had a villain monologue. I was able to step back and look at the whole piece because I had the whole piece there. And then I was able to be like, where can I insert it throughout the story? And how can I go in and edit that instead of just redoing the first couple couple chapters over and over again and not understanding? A lot of times you won't be able to show the full antagonist, show all of the voice and the flair and all of that stuff. I mean, until... 
a chunk into the book, and then as yeah. you're going, so you you have to you really have to keep going for a lot of these type of edits. It's not a stop and go back and fix and then keep going. Yes, just get the full first draft down. Yes, that's a big thing. It is. I mean, it really is because when you and sometimes it's easy. I mean, sometimes if you start writing, you get totally obsessed and you just pop out a book and boom, you have a book and it's like, yay, you know, but then you need to go back and reread your book and realize that there's some stuff that you need to (laughs) make, make more better because it is just not where it needs to be. And that is okay. Like these are all just learning process stuff and, and rolling in, but Gosh, everybody loves a good villain. And think about the villains that you love the most. Think about those little sneaky villains or the ones that you just didn't know they were so horrible. And then you start getting these little snippets of stuff and things are being revealed, just like with your protagonist. So if you're starting to drift in with information for your protagonist, it's the same way with your villain. You start realizing that, yeah, okay, they're the bad guy. We got it. Or the bad girl, whatever. They're the bad person. Why are they bad? What are their motives? What are their thoughts? What are their morals? Because they have morals too. Everybody has a moral line. And they should be consistent with their morals just as much as the protagonist is. They might save children from orphanages, but they destroy whatever else. But why? Everybody has their own morals. They have their own lines. There's stuff that absolutely is highly, highly offensive to certain people. And a villain is one of those people who jumps over that line and is offensive. Like they're going to come in on certain points where a population would be like, oh, I cannot believe you just did that. I can't believe that's something you would stand for. Tell me why they stand for it. I think too, and not just looking at movies and literature and TV shows and all the different entertainment mediums we have, history has some phenomenal Gosh. ones. Yes. And the ones that just snuck in and people didn't even realize it or they realized it too late or it just kind of happened and they were so charismatic that they just got caught up in the moment and, and it became this mob mentality. Really intrigued by villain motivations and what creates like a yeah. like actual living among us, like, I don't know, Hitler or some serial killer or whatever. Yes. You will be able to find information about how they were raised and their life story. Yeah. And that can be super eye-opening to see how those type of mentalities and personalities can form. So in a believable way. Yeah. Because you're looking at And it can be absolutely terrifying. But honestly, that really makes a good villain, too. When it gets creepy, oh, man, that's good stuff. I think, um, gosh, I keep thinking we're talking about, like, sneaky villains or – and I – I keep wanting to say, like, one of my favorite villains, um, but I'm afraid I'm going to, like, ruin information. It's from a movie. It's called Pet. It is a horror movie. And it is, like, I I don't even want to say what type of villain it is because I don't want to (laughs) ruin or surprise anything. You know what? I'm just going to say it. It's one of those where... Spoiler alert, everybody. (laughs) Spoiler alert. If you're going to watch Pet, hold up. Let's just (laughs) skip. Okay? Okay. Well, it's... Got that clear. You're not going to guess the ending. It's... Nothing's what you think it is. That's super cool. I love and stuff like that. And you're so on board for what's happening. And it's so clear. And you're so, like, I just sat there stunned at the end. And Oh, all, that's it, the best. It all made sense. <gasps> I just like, left cracked. the most beautiful cupcakes everywhere. Yeah. Oh. And I was like, holy shit, what just happened to my brain? That's awesome. I now think I need it was to watch that. A beautiful writing experience to see how the writer expressed these characters and slowly peeled away layers of and the impressions you got from them and the things that you assumed it was really really good um and so stuff like that is really fun and there are throughout history that i mean most of the biggest villains that are in history books have convinced thousands of people hundreds of people or whatever to follow them to do horrible things for them to believe in them they were charismatic or they had and how that happens why that happens and the mentality understanding that and researching it gives a stronger belief of reality into your fake world I completely agree. And I know it's a fake world, and maybe they're, like, shooting fireballs and have magical swords. But at the same time, the purpose of your reading is to fall into a world and have it be real. I mean, that is your reading slash imagination working together to create this experience. And that's what's so cool about reading is that you can find a different perspective where you would never live in a world where there's fireballs flying through the air. 
but you are right now because you're reading it and it has to be real and you can't drop out of it because your villain's just the bad guy. You want to sell that shit. So, well, and even though it is a fantasy world or a world that doesn't exist with people that aren't real, if there's not a logic and consistency to the character in depth, it's not believable. Right. And it's it's this crazy thing because we're going to be okay with dragons and fireballs or we're going to be okay with, I don't know, whatever crazy scenario you give us. Yeah. But give us a person whose makeup isn't consistent and doesn't make sense. We're like, nope. I'm not believing nope. that. I believe the <laughs> dragon, but that crap? Nope. No, thank you. I know, right? Yeah. It's so true. Um, and I think that's genre specific, too. I mean, if you're going into a world of dragons, obviously you are all about knowing that dragons are going to be in that world. So that's cool. But if your humanizing qualities are not human, oops. Yeah, and there has to be humanizing qualities to some extent, even if you're writing sci-fi and aliens, because the reader needs to identify with something. In order to emotionally connect and care to what's going to happen, they have to identify with something, or they have to completely understand why they don't identify. A complete contrast. Yes. Which is a, that's a tricky line to play. Gosh, it is. You really got to sell that in such a really gotta sell that and it's <laughs> I, I don't have any advice for that one that's just that's hard. some Good super luck. character development <laughs> where you really fall into that world and i'm trying to think of like anything that really does that and i think deep horror can be some dark romance can be i mean but i think everybody has that line where you just can't cross certain things because it just hurts to do so but some people fall right into that world as a reader and they're like yes give me those things that i could never stomach in the real world but this is my safe place this is my fantasy spot and that's okay too but you still have to make it so realistic that they literally fall into your world and can live it for sure and i think that's where you can also play with a lot of gray characters and yes so which is a good point too because i did want to mention with gray characters obviously we talked about your protagonist needs to have um, faults and weaknesses Mm -hmm. your villain needs to have strengths and relatable qualities yes it can't all be They choose what repulses everyone all the time. That's why they're the bad guy. They hurt and kill people. If you want a villain that is charismatic, that is engaging, that does make the reader be like, they're back. What happens next? Yeah. There has to actually be things that are relatable about them. There has to be strengths. There has to be good qualities entangled with the really bad stuff. Yeah. That makes you realize, okay, you have to lose, but oh, I'm sorry, you have to lose. And so, gosh, muddy up your protagonist and i guess like sparkle up your antagonist i don't know i didn't come up with a good one for this i'm literally picturing like a good one rag where i'm just like shining up a yeah. butt till it sparkles i don't know why it's a butt right? but it's a butt it's so like that's cool. a thing make it sparkle or something yeah it's true though everybody has to be realistic and to be realistic you have to have qualities that make sense to people who are reading and there has to be a cell quality to it whether they're charismatic whether they're totally not charismatic but their mission makes sense that's always a creepy factor for me that really brings the creep out when you're like oh my god he's evil but i get it Ah. I, I might secretly join his team don't tell anyone right like oh what's gonna happen because i kind of want to put on that hashtag t-shirt right now and I shouldn't. (laughs) I shouldn't because I know it's not right, but like, oh man, like it makes sense. Yeah. But so here's the thing too, where I think the protagonist wins out in the end. And this is why it works is because in the beginning of the story, your protagonist has a lot to learn, right? And we talked about how they have to have that arc where they should be different in the beginning and the ending. Mm -hmm. And so usually your protagonist doesn't be more faulty. It might be even matched whose side you're going to be on. Mm -hmm. But as they learn and grow and become better and stronger and have this beautiful arc, ideally your antagonist does not. Your antagonist kind of holds on to these same faulty beliefs or And they are sticking to their guts. Yeah. Yeah. They do not learn. Do they not grow? They cannot move beyond it. They are a dog with a bone and they cannot let it go. Right. Which is why they have to lose. Yeah, so I think sometimes, too, what can happen is the beginning, there's like a... And that's an interesting way to show growth in the protagonist as well, is how Mm -hmm. much they vary from the antagonist throughout their arc. 
Oh, yeah. That's good stuff, too. Yeah. So it's like two brothers that came from the exact same background and stuff, but like one would eat. Oh, Loki and Thor. So like stuff like that. I mean, granted, they're not the same, but it is like that. And, there's you know, they sort of the came from the same thing. And there's yeah things where you have a hope and you can see because they both are like, okay, well, look at how much Thor is changing and growing and becoming. So how is Loki going to change? Oh, he's not. Oh, he's he's just he's just holding to that. Okay, although he's there is a new Loki it. movie, Loki movie where they might challenge that, but we'll see. I am not lying. I am so freaking excited. I can't even stand it. <laughs> that's gonna be. A I am. One. I'm just gonna put my hashtag those, Loki shirt right that's now. That's one of those villains like the Joker, though. That is entertaining to watch. Yes, they are because, chaos. Mm, he's got the intelligence too, but yes, they're fun and charismatic and funny, like a funny mm-hmm. witty villain. Yes. Steals the damn stage, I'm telling you. Oh, man, every time. In all the right ways. I'm so glad they lose, but at the same time, I'm so glad they were in the story because it would not be there without these amazingly entertaining antagonists. Oh, God, I love a good so, entertaining antagonist. which should bring up the point, and now you like it makes sense why we have to put as much backstory and effort and development into mm-hmm. the antagonist as we do the protagonist. Yeah. Because... You thought it was going to be so easy to just go write a story and vomit it out and you're done, right? Right. (laughs) Uh, That's funny. It's true. (laughs) But man, it's so rewarding when you get it done and when you hit it right and when you're just like so excited to just share that. Ah, it's the best feeling ever. It's so worthwhile. And when you nail that, when you actually develop and you think of something new and you're brainstorming with your tribe and you're like, getting it it's like i got it and then you put them in and they are phenomenal and everybody was like oh you get those gasp moments and you get people texting you like i can't believe you just did that poppy and i'm like thank goodness i win (laughs) i have won this day i have it's like just the best feeling ever is when you get that right man i love both the antagonist and the protagonist and I think one of my favorite, even a trope, I guess, or genre is you end up with like adventure antagonistic forces. Nature is such a fun antagonistic force. Bears, the I, ocean. I think nature is a great one, too, to talk about um, and how it makes it easier to see. But I think it can apply to all villains. But it's easier to point out the patterns with mm-hmm. nature is the tension that an antagonist offers to a story. Yes. I mean, sure, you can have lots of other tension or awkward moments or clumsy characters, but that's different. Mm -hmm. Like the tension of your protagonist wanting to go for a goal and your antagonistic force stopping them. Yes. The way they stop them should vary. When they're going to stop them shouldn't always be predictable. How it's going to stop them. And you can really play with that a lot with nature. And I'm going to keep saying volcanoes, but I don't know, dinosaurs? The mountain. I, there's a there's a movie, and honestly, I watched it probably two decades ago, and I can't think of the name of it right now. But um, it might have been Everest, uh, where they're climbing, and it's like the antagonist is the exact thing that they're striving to conquer, and it's like holy moly, and the tension from that was just absolutely intense, um, with the ropes and everything that this mountain was putting against, and the weather, and it was just absolutely the most scary thrilling terrifying thing because you can't really like deny nature i think all movies like that where they're fighting against something natural happening the some part of the world falling apart it's not the same battle every time there's probably three or four battles there's a mini there's your mid mark in your book where there's a decent sized battle there's everything goes wrong and your big ending but they can't all be the same so if the rope broke or Mm -hmm. If the weather drops and there's ice, like, it, you can't have the same thing happening over and over. So you have no. to get creative in how this natural force or animal or whatever is combating them. Yeah. And it's not a factor anymore about being funny or charismatic or witty. Yes. It's about surviving, quite literally. And it's about looking at scenarios and how what different things can happen and how you can make them believable. Yeah. Which is a great exercise in itself, even if you're not writing an antagonistic force like that. That's true. And if you're a human and you've been, you know, 
stuck in a thunderstorm, like, you know, what's up, nature's going to do what it's going to do. It's not it's not an antagonist you need to explain, because you live on the world, and the world's going to do what it does. And so that is such a great antagonist for the sheer fact that there is no controlling the situation. So that is really fun in a way for your protagonist to have to deal with, because there's no saying like, lock them up, obviously, chop them to bits have a conversation and try to talk them down from being a complete and utter jerk face. Like you can't do that with nature because it's nature. So that is so fun. It's the definition too of unchanging. Talk about a flat arc. Oh yeah. The protagonist has to change and move and adapt. Not the antagonist. No. I mean, you can have the antagonist, but you really want your motivations and your reactions and developments to be with your protagonist. Yes. And that's a great way to show it. I like that a lot. It is. Yes. That's always like, I don't know. I really love, I know that you're going to groan at this one. Cass groans at this one. Oh, no. Cast away. Oh. You know, (laughs) there she goes. Oh, I've never even been able to finish it, so I won't complain. God, I love that movie. It's so So boring. Cast away is one of those, oh, my God, it's the best. I've never in my life sat through a movie where it was like 8% of it was was conversation and the rest was silence and it just it did it it was good that was fantastic for me because this antagonist was the ocean you can't really deny the ocean the ocean is the ocean it takes up a whole lot of the world and we live in it and we have to adapt and it was so amazing to see the protagonist have to adapt to the situation over a series of years and how long it took him to overcome himself and just building up to become this person who's like, okay, if I die, I die. But you know what? I got to get the hell out of here. And it was just so amazing. And Cass is groaning some more and just being like, yeah. No, okay. I'm just like, do, do, do. So cool. okay. I know, sure. right? Uh, uh, I why appreci- do they have to be so silent? I appreciate I your enjoyment in that story. Right? <laughs> sure you do. It's cool. It's cool. It's okay. Whatever. I bet you everyone else listening loves Castaway too, and it's probably just me. Not everybody, but at the same time, it's some of you guys do. It's a very popular show. It, it did well. Gosh, it was incredible. Anyway, <laughs> um, there's so many things that he has to adapt to to deal with the fact that the antagonist is not movable. It's not going to be somebody you can talk down. It's not going to be somebody you can arrest or get rid of. It's an ocean. And I think that once you get a handle on that concept by looking at it as an antagonistic force like that and then apply those same principles to a villain. Yeah. I think that's really interesting. I agree with you on that one too. Make nature a villain. Boom. Like not changing has a mission. This is what I do. Or make yep. villain like nature. That's what I meant. Yeah. Villain like nature. I so you. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I really enjoy stuff like that. That's always fun. And then, of course, you always have the antagonistic, like, inner point, the inner voice that will that will allow you to be the person that you need to be. That's an anta- a huge antagonistic force in uh, chiclet, in um, romance, in literary, in, in all kinds of genres, actually, that one spreads where they just can't get over themselves. And that's, that's an antagonistic force. You get to reveal slowly throughout the story Mm -hmm. um memories and other voices that have stayed with that person and have created this belief um that's and i think that makes a character so relatable and it just makes readers sympathize with them yes and they're like oh oh i know I know. I want to see how this plays out because I get it. And like, I can be empathetic to that. Because I have this problem too. One of us has to conquer it. Or I know somebody who has, or I can just totally understand it because I'm a human and that's a human condition. And it's like, ah, that is so freaking hard to stomach. And at the same time, it's so rewarding when they either get over it or something happens where they just deal with it. It doesn't always have to be a happy ending for things like that when it's your own force or if it's like a, I mean, anything. There's there's so many different antagonistic forces um, that come with a person. 
But oh, I just really enjoy those moments where it's not necessarily that they that they change, but sometimes they adapt to themselves or they realize that this is what they're doing and that they shouldn't do that or somebody fits the way that they are and they understand them. Man, those are really rewarding as well. But they just have to take a moment. You know, so I'm sitting here thinking, we had talked a little bit with protagonists about understanding their culture and mm-hmm. their religious beliefs and their heritage. Yes. And I had talked a little bit about how I tend to pull from my own heritage, my main characters. I think we should definitely put a little disclaimer out there that you should you should be aware of the heritage and culture of your um, antagonist. I agree with you as and well. And you should probably be aware if it's a minority. Like, I take space special care and thought to that i completely agree with you if you're only um if your only person of color or your only diverse character is your bad person you need to rethink your characters in your script you need to consider yes diversity is fantastic and add diversity but don't make it where they're they're the literal only bad guy that's not cool No, it's not. And you have to think about that, too. Are you villainizing a group of people? And if you're not, then it shouldn't matter if you change out culture, sexual preference, skin color. I mean, all of that stuff. It shouldn't matter if you swap it out if that's not the core reason of why they're a villain. Right. And so that's something to look at, too. I always try and look at, I don't know why, but I'm always drawn to female villains. I think female villains because it's not typical because it always ends up being this dude who's the bad guy because he's strong and he's mad and it's like he wants to change the world. Why can't a girl be like that too? I have a lot of female villains. I have a female villain. You do so have a lot it, of female yeah. villains. I like your female villain. I do They're have a lot great. of female villains. Um, <laughs> but I'm a female, so I think I can get away with it a little bit. And I have female protagonists. And you kind of have to you have to be aware of that stuff too. And it's good to have a variety and to just – I think the key with diversity is we can't pretend that we're all the same because we're right, not. Right. So, so that doesn't answer me like, oh, oh, I don't see that. I see everyone is the same. Well, then you're not seeing everyone because we're not the same. None of us are the same. So your bad guys should be diverse and careful what that's representing. Careful what your motivations are for that. Yeah. You know, and if you if you are on the line of it and you are worried because you have a villain that is diverse – Make sure that you have sensitivity readers to read it because your sensitivity readers will be like, oh, yeah, you can't. I'm really offended. And it's like, okay, okay, I need to not offend, but I need to be real because we live in a real world and we have real problems and we have real people. We have diverse culture, depending on where you're at. Everybody has different locations. But if your bad guy is a diverse character and that's your only diverse character and they're just a bad guy because they're angry about being diverse, that is a giant issue. And that is just no. So make sure that it's because they're a person and because they have real motivation, not just because they're deaf or blind or a person of color or anything like that, or an old white guy. Make sure they're a person. That's really, really important. And I think that was something that we really hit on with the protagonist was make sure they're a person. Make them as real as you can. Yeah. Um, and Poppy was talking about sensitivity readers. Sensitivity readers are, can be tricky to find. I still struggle, struggle with trying to find them because I need so many different types of sensitivity readers. And I am on the hunt and it's basically all the writing communities that you find, all the online. When you find your tribe. Yeah, so you can yep. put a search out for that. But I will say when you're looking at diverse characters, I have found YouTube invaluable. Um, oh, yes. Every absolutely. single person of every variety and flavor out there is posting stuff on YouTube, is telling their story. Yeah. And it you, you learn so much from someone when it's from someone who lives that diversity. Right? Yes. Yeah. Versus, and it like just cadences and movements and so many things you can pick up on that you can't from reading history books that may not be accurate. So you just never know. Yeah. Yeah. So YouTube's a big one for me when researching characters and different types. Because we talked, too, about making sure dialogue is unique for your characters, um, Mm -hmm. for your protagonist, how they speak, their swears, their cultural and beliefs. So that's one of the things, too, that's big and why that. Because how they swear or their metaphors, what they compare things to, um, same for your antagonist. Uh, Yes. And it's... What are your antagonist hobbies? Yeah. I love stuff like that. Like, why are they, what are they saying a metaphor about? Or like, even if they say it out loud and you're not in their POV, 
what do they relate to the most? You know, do they love orchids? And that is like what they have in a greenhouse at their house. Like, yeah, they then might I need be them to super tell me mad. All of their secrets. Right? I mean, <laughs> they might be super mad about, you know, the government or whatever, but like they have an orchids at their house and that is super important to them. And there's all kinds of different ways that you can create these characters, but make sure that they're consistent. Make sure that the stuff that they say means something to them, not necessarily everybody else. Don't make it a blanket conversation, boring dialogue. The Have dialogue it be should something be interesting. just to push plot forward. And it shouldn't be revealing their plans. Yeah. Your dialogue should have flavor and taste for them. And yeah. make them intelligent about what they say out loud and what they don't. Right? Because if you're a villain, are you really going to be around going, guess what? I'm the bad guy. I mean, if you're Joker, you totally are. So I guess it depends on your villain. Yeah, Joker or Loki. He's like, yeah, Loki's like, yeah, I don't care what you And I'm hot while I do it, right? Right? (laughs) I'm hot, but whatever, cool. Maybe that uh, that attitude and that charisma and that confidence, sure, yes, absolutely, (laughs) that that will do it. Um, Oh, book boy villains. Anyway, but... (laughs) I just take a little pause on that one. Bobby's got some hard eyes right now. I do. Okay. Anyway, so I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm sure it was great. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Poppy needs a minute to collect herself. She's going to drool over Loki for a little while. It's cool. It's cool. (sighs) Sigh. So anyway, if there's anything else... I, I mean, like everything else we've talked about, it's going to take multiple rounds of editing to get all these details down. It is. It is not a first-time shot you're going to nail both of these characters right out of the gate. It's just not going to happen. Be patient I can't even tell you yourself. how much I wish that that would happen because I am that author that is like, I'm going to write this and I'm going to pass it over and it's going to be awesome. It's not. It's totally not, but and you're probably not going to okay. believe her. Some of you, and that that's okay. You'll you're not, it out. and that's okay too. Yeah. In a couple of years, you're going to come back and be like, "Damn it, Puppy was right." Gah! I do that all the time. I tell myself that I'm like, "I was wrong." Crap. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes because, no one yeah. can tell you you're wrong, but you. You just have to figure. It's it. true. That is so true because people would be like, no, it's going to be like this. I'm like, okay, yeah, sure it is. Guess what? They were totally right. I'm sorry, people, that I denied. I'm sorry. (laughs) And and that's that's okay if you think that we're entirely (laughs) wrong on things because there's a high chance that we probably are on some things. It's possible, yes. I mean, as long as you keep writing, if you keep writing, you win. That's it. Keep writing, finish your work so that you have something to work with. I think that's the most important part is that you can't have a story to work with and to make better unless you actually have a story that is complete. Don't stop. Keep punching your keys. Keep going forward. You have to have a full story. Then you're going to go through and edit it and you're going to make your protagonist, your antagonist, you're going to make them shine. I have a challenge that I don't oh, know if Poppy's your, gonna like. I was like about the her. challenge. Oh no! Okay, what's your challenge? <laughs> so I'm since so we curious. know um, what Poppy stays up dreaming about at night, I want to know what you <laughs> stay up at night dreaming about. Give me villain crushes. <gasps> Who are villains crushes! that you just so many. totally crush over? I want to hear about them. Yep. Yep. Man, give me some Zorg any day. <laughs> and that's the guy from <laughs> Toy Story. No. Oh. <laughs> That's the guy the from like the- Fifth Element. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Zork from Toy Story? Isn't that who Buzz Lightyear battles? I have no clue. It's yes, possible. I have and kids. Okay. <laughs> if it is Zorg, it is totally from the Fifth Element, which is just the bomb. It is a good bad guy. Movie. Zorg is the bomb. Okay. <laughs> Okay. But he's totally a bad guy. He should not rule the world. It's cool. It's cool. (laughs) Give us your villain crushes. Keep punching the keys. It doesn't matter if you're doing everything differently and however you want and you think everyone else is wrong or everything's right and it's too hard and there's too much of it and you can't get it all. I don't care. Just don't stop punching the keys. No. Keep at it. Keep at it. It's going to come together. We absolutely promise. Just keep going, Pete punching the keys keep putting down your work finish your stuff it's gonna be great you got this thank you so much for hanging out with us and if you liked this episode please subscribe and give us that clickable five-star love got writer questions or feedback reach out through our website and until next time make sure to punch the keys